Merry Christmas. Uh, I think this is a wonderful time of year to celebrate Christmas in the Northern Hemisphere when it's cold and dark. And you know, uh, our life group had a wonderful experience the other night. We, we have a terrace up above our home and we built a fire up there and we put our, our chairs around and, and I actually had run an extension cord over so that I could have a little cedar tree there that, that was covered with Christmas lights. And, and I thought, what a great opportunity for us to not only draw around the warmth and the light of the fire, but to be able to share what God is doing in our lives. Uh, I have a friend who said that there's no conversation starter as effective as a campfire. And somehow in the darkness around us and then pulling towards the light, not only do we you know, toast some marshmallows and have some laughs, but we can share what God is doing in our life. And I hope that that's a picture as we go to the book of John and he talks about Jesus being light. And I hope that I can help us get to a place where with all the busyness of Christmas, with all the, the sense that it's already a very familiar story, that God can move our hearts to worship and to reconnection and recommitment to him. And so I want to look at John chapter 1. And I believe what John tells us is a story of recreation. And so I've entitled the message Recreation because Jesus is talked about as the one who did the first creation, and then he's talked about as he does a recreation. We become a new creation in Christ. And so I'm going to begin reading in John chapter 1. If you have your Bibles or if you open your YouVersion app, I just want to read to you the first four verses. And even though they're familiar, I want them to sink in in a new way. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him... All things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and the life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. You see, he, he starts at a different place than the other four gospels or the other three gospels. Matthew talks about the genealogy and, and who were the, the parents and grandparents of Joseph and Mary. And then Luke talks about all of the individuals around the story of the shepherds and of Mary's experience. And as Pastor Will talked to us through Christmas story last week and, and what each of them contributed. And Mark starts with Jesus at age 30 going, let's get right into the ministry part of it. And John takes a different point of view. He, he steps back and says, let's look at this from the 30,000 point of view. If you don't understand how infinite God is, how magnificent, how big, then I tell you, he, he became human. He became a baby. You won't really get it. And so he starts with, in the beginning was the word. And when you and I think of word, we think of words on a page or the spoken word. But the Greeks and the Hebrews thought of it in a different way. They thought of the word being like the logic behind the universe, like the architect that draws the blueprints for everything. That there is some principle behind all of that, and, and they call that the Word. And that's a, a wonderful, big picture of Jesus. And it says, He was in the beginning with God, and He was God. And of course, this is one of those beautiful statements where the, the Trinity clearly comes out. And then it says, And He is the Creator. He made everything. In fact, He's very explicit. He says, There's not a single thing that's been made that He didn't make. And that also is a reference to the Trinity because many places in Scripture it says God, and we think God the Father created the world. And here it says that Jesus created it. And in Genesis 1, it says the Spirit hovers over the, the face of the deep. So that was the beginning of creation. And so he says Jesus was the creator, that he was in the beginning and he made everything. What did he say? And he takes us back to the book of Genesis and this Starting of the story of Christmas, he takes us back to Genesis. And in Genesis, it says, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and that he separated the light from the darkness. So in John, he starts talking about the light comes into the world. But he says, I want you to back up and realize, where did that light come from? That God spoke. And Jesus is the creator, and he is the one who said, In the beginning, let there be light which isn't just the physical light that we can see, as wonderful as that is. It's all of the energy and all of the power and all of the universe. And, you know, light is a wonderful thing. And I don't know about you, but 
I'm affected by light. And when I come home in the middle of the summer and, and there's plenty of daylight left, I can work outside till 7.30 and 8 o'clock at night and, and I feel energized and ready to go. And when I come home at this time of year, it's like 4.30, it starts getting dark. And by the time I get home at 5 or 5.30, I just want to go in the house and be by the fireplace. And, and it's amazing, the energy level. And, and so when he talks about light, I can relate to that sense that, that not only is light a wonderful thing, but it gives energy and life. And, and Jesus said, you know where that came from? I said, let there be. And, and I've been uh, building a little tree house this year and just enjoying putting it together and thinking about how to build it and, and building the pieces in my head sometimes uh, when I'm lying in bed before I even go outside to work on it. And I think, what would it take for somebody to just say, let there be a treehouse and it would be made, let alone somebody that could say, let there be a city or let there be a planet. And God said, let there be light. He made all of the energy and matter that makes up a million suns. And John says, I want you to get a picture of this. I want you to, to have a picture of the magnificence of Jesus. Otherwise, you're not going to really get it. And then he goes on and he says, not only did God create light, that he created life. And in Genesis 2-7, it says, And the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. So we have this powerful picture. He speaks, and the universe is thrown into place. And then we have this very intimate and very amazing picture where it says that God took and formed a, a human being out of clay, out of dirt, and that into this statue, this dirt statue, he breathed into his nostrils. It's a very intimate, personal picture. It says he breathed into him, and this unliving thing became a living being. He said, the body that you've been given is an amazing gift. And you know where it came from? It came from God who breathed life into Adam, and and the life that you have is because of Jesus. And so he starts us off on this big, huge picture that the Word was in the beginning, and the Word created, and I want you to get a huge picture of who God is so that you understand, and so that the, the story of Christmas moves you and changes you. And so he starts off with those foundations as he's going to talk in John 1 about Jesus being the light and Jesus being the life. And he reminds us, where did those things come from? And so as we get the big picture, then we move into the next part of the story where he says, Jesus brought a new creation, that he brought us life, that he was life that entered into the world. And I've been to Israel a number of times and sometimes we come in out over the Mediterranean Sea. And by the time you get to Israel, you've been flying sometimes well, you've been traveling for 24, 28 hours sometimes, and, uh, and you get that just can't wait to get there, and my legs are cramped, and I'm tired of being in this plane. And you look out in that darkness over the water, and you can see nothing. And finally, you see a little light, and you go, that's Tel Aviv. That's where the airport is. That's, we're almost there. And you realize that the Jewish people had been waiting for the light, um, all the way through the Old Testament, there have been stories about the Messiah, about the one who will come and he'll bring a new covenant and that the Holy Spirit will come on all of us and that, that Jesus will be able to take out our heart of stone and give us a living heart and all of these prophecies. And then for 400 years, there had been no written scripture and they call them the silent years and you think they've been waiting and waiting and waiting and finally Jesus comes and he brings life. And uh, John goes on to say, in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. That Jesus brought eternal life, spiritual life, relationship with God life. And it says, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So he, he takes us back to the beginning and says, remember who Jesus is and what he did, that he created life and light, and that he's been promised and coming and awaited and finally he came, and then he says, you know what, it may not seem like much. I don't know if you, if you can look at a baby in a manger and think this is going to change the world. 
He says, the light has come into the darkness, and the darkness, in the NIV it says, has not overcome it. Some versions read, has not extinguished it. And you think of the lights that they were talking about. They, they weren't lights of huge electronic, you know, searchlights, or they were not the kind of light that we're used to being around. It would be a torch or a lamp or a little smoky oil lamp that they would carry with them. And he said, you know, the, the light has come and the darkness has not overcome it, has not extinguished it, and furthermore, will never extinguish it. And of course, from our vantage point 2,000 years later, we know how the, the light of Jesus has spread over the world. But for them, it must have seemed such a tentative, such a, a questionable thing. And he says, you know what? The light came into darkness, and the darkness will never push it back. The light will always push back the darkness. And then if you're listening and you're thinking about John's story, you're thinking, how did that happen? And there's a very, very powerful phrase in here I want us to get. It says, and the word, the organizing logic of the universe, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. He wants to impress on us what an amazing thing this is. And so he says, the word became flesh. And, and the word there if you could hear it in the original language, it's almost offensive. The invisible, infinite God became a chunk of meat. And you think, really? And the word that that comes from is the word carne. And you would think of carne asada or chili con carne, it's meat. And you think, that's, that's almost offensive to say that the invisible, infinite God became a chunk of meat. And as we were sharing this, in, in the sermon uh, evaluation, uh, Heather said, you know, I, I thought about that more and more. And, I, and as I walked away thinking about that, I thought, Jesus didn't just put on a meat suit. No, it, you think about your body and you think about what you've experienced this last week. I, I, I find that as I get older, my skin gets far more fragile. And I, I just ran into a little piece of the porch and just peeled a whole bunch of skin back. And Boy, I tell you, if I'm walking out in the rain, I, I feel the rain on my head. Uh, when I don't have a coat, it, it feels cold. And, and when I get to pick up my bonus grandson and hug him, it feels wonderful. And you think, what does it mean that we have a body? And you think, what did Jesus do? Jesus, the one who had been infinite, unbounded, without needs, all of a sudden became welded to a human body. That the one who had had no needs now was hungry and couldn't feed himself. He was thirsty and could do nothing about it. He was helpless. He was, he was placed in a little stone box called a manger, which had been used for feeding cows and sheep. He that had filled the universe now had a very small space. And he could experience sickness and pain. The Bible says he experienced temptation. He experienced loss. He experienced rejection. And you know the incredible story that the God who flung the universe into space had become so limited because that's the way that he could provide salvation for you and for me. That that's the way that, that he could go on and be our representative because he understands what it's like to be a human being. It's, it's why when you and I pray to him, we know that he understands. Because the Bible says he was tempted in every way that we are, and yet he didn't sin. That we come, that, that this story of Christmas becomes so hopeful to us because Jesus understands. Because Jesus gave up his infiniteness so that he could be confined to become one of us. And if you read through the rest of the scripture, you realize that Jesus became 100% human and 100% God, and he keeps that human body through the rest of eternity, it seems, that this was a permanent transition. And because of that, he brings life to us. John goes on to say, he is life, eternal life, real life, life with God the Father. And there's a a wonderful piece that we haven't yet talked about in the Christmas story. We've talked about the angels and the magi, and we've talked about Mary and Joseph. But there's this wonderful moment where this bigger picture of Jesus is emphasized in Luke. And it's when 
Joseph and Mary have already had the baby Jesus, and 40 days after the birth, according to the, the laws of Israel, they were to bring that child to the temple, and they were to bring an offering. And they were part of the old covenant where they lived under laws, and they killed animals as part of the sacrifice for, for sin and for cleansing. And this was a part of their religious process. And when they came to the temple, you, you think of this picture, and I have no idea what Herod knew, probably nothing at this point, but they're bringing the, the king of the Jews into the central city, Jerusalem, of Herod. And they come into this, who knows what they were thinking or what their experience was, but all of a sudden, this guy comes out, and his name is Simeon. And the Bible says he was righteous and he was devout. I thought, you know, I don't know how they will describe me after I'm gone, but what, what wonderful words were chosen for Simeon, that even though this light had been promised for so long, he had remained faithful. And in fact, in his relationship with God, God had promised him, you're not going to die, Simeon, until you see the consolation of Israel, until you see the one that I have sent. And so he comes out as they walk into the temple square and, and he takes the baby out of their hands and, and in this incredible moment, he says this, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all the nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. You want to know where we are in the Christmas story? We're right here. He says, it's a revelation to the Gentiles. That Jesus came not just to Jerusalem, not just to the Jewish people. He came. In fact, the name Jesus means sa saving or salvation. He came to save his people from their sins. And so, can you imagine the surprise of Mary and Joseph walking in and all of a sudden somebody comes up and takes their baby out of their hands and starts praying and, and holding up this child? And, and I think there were so many of these little moments that helped Mary and Joseph get through the next tough 30 years because they could see that God was at work and that this was something special. And he says, this child is going to be the light of revelation for the Gentiles and glory to your people Israel. That he is the light, that, the life that came into the world. And John says, and that life was the light of all mankind. And of course, now we can see the, the light of Jesus spreading all across the globe. For 2,000 years, People have been following and believing. And the light that came to that little cave in Bethlehem has been carried by faithful people who've been telling the story of Jesus and telling the fact that he's the one that brings hope. He's the one that, that gives us life eternal. He's the one that died so that our sins could be forgiven. And that story has come down to us. And I don't know what you're going through this year because this has been an extra hard year. And in addition to the things that we normally experience, all of the COVID regulations and all of the, the controversies, there's been some wonderful places where people have found Jesus to be their hope. In fact, I think it shows one of the blessings, if you will, of all of this season is it's shaken so many things that we have leaned on way too much. And for many of us, it's caused us to pull back and to say, if I'm going to find my security, it has to be in things that won't shake. It has to be in Jesus. And Shauna Murphy is a great counselor in our staff here, and she's also the director of Renewal Ministries. And she's been a part of encouraging and comforting people for years here. And each Christmas, we try to get together and do a special service called Hope for the Holidays. And it's to try to focus people as we go through Thanksgiving and Christmas, and, and especially if you've lost a loved one, those first holiday events are really hard. And so we've tried to take a time and sometimes it's been a separate service, a separate meeting in an evening, or sometimes it's been a part of our, of our weekend experience. But we've tried to say hope is in Jesus. It's not in having the traditions that you've had before or even the people that you've had around you before. And so normally Shauna would be up here on stage and I'd be interviewing her. And, and this has been a really tough year for her family. Gary was diagnosed in February with cancer and is Gary and Shauna have gone through this year of chemo and of being particularly isolated and, and homeschooling their kids, as many of you have. She's found the things that she's told others to also be things that hold her. 
And some of the people that she's encouraged have, have stepped up to encourage her. And I'm just going to let her share a little bit from her story and her heart about how Jesus has been a hopeful light to her in the middle of this darkness and some suggestions for maybe how, if you're needing some hope for this season, you can find that as well. Let's listen to Shauna. Hi, I'm Shauna Murphy, and I'm the Renewal Ministry Director here at Family Church. And boy, it has been a year full of losses. And I know, personally, I've experienced a lot of losses this year. Um, My husband has lost his health and been battling some health issues. And because of that, my family um, has been quarantined and in isolation since March. We've lost the inability to um, see family and friends, to go to our jobs, to go to church, Our kids have been unable to go to school or see their friends. Um, I've had friends move across the country, and I've walked alongside friends and those that I've counseled um, who have lost loved ones, um, parents, children, babies, jobs. They've been going through divorces. They've lost their homes. It has been a tough year of losses. And I think one of the greatest losses we've experienced is our loss of security and life as we knew it to be and what we expected it to be. But I'm here today to talk to you about hope. And that hope is found in Jesus, who is our light in the darkness. John 1, 4, and 5 says, In him there was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light that shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And I love that it says that the darkness has not overcome it. And so the question I want us to reflect on today is, are we letting the darkness overcome us? Or are we managing our pain and working through our losses? You see, I believe that when we face into our grief and our losses, that we can allow God's grace and his presence and his healing to intersect with our pain. And it's when we come to him with our losses and our grief that I believe that great transformation can occur. And the first step of that process is just showing up, which you've done today, and I'm so glad that we're all in this together. But it's also important that you take the time to experience um, your grief, to name your losses, to identify what you've lost. My guess is a lot of you have lost things that maybe you haven't even sat down and really identified in this past year. And there's that saying that time heals all wounds, but I don't think that's true. I think time just passes. If we aren't intentional about going through the grief process and experiencing our grief, then quite honestly, I think we can get stuck in our grief. And so it's important to identify our losses, to name what we're experiencing. And not just that, but to name our emotions that go along with that. And I think we experience a lot of emotions when we grieve, irritability and sadness and forgetfulness and and on and on. And all of those emotions are valid when we're grieving. And sometimes I think we have to even go through that day by day to identify our emotions that are going along with our losses. But then the important thing is that we hand them over to God each and every day, that we ask him to come and heal us, to minister to our grieving hearts, that we seek him in that process Psalm 16, 8 says, I will keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. And that verse has meant a lot to me these past few months. And I want to encourage you to keep your eyes always, that's a hard word, always on the Lord, putting your eyes on him. Recognize that he is life and light. And it is light that gives us the ability, our eyes, the ability to see the things clearly in front of us. Light is by which we are allowed to identify the things of God, to see his working, even in our losses, even in our pain. And we can keep our eyes on him and and see the light when we take time to be in his word, to listen to music, to worship, to be in his creation, to just be still and be with him in his presence, um, and to be a part of a local community of the body of Christ. But you see, we have a choice each and every day, sometimes it's hour by hour and moment by moment, to either let the darkness overcome, to let all the pain and the circumstances cloud our vision, or we can let the light in and we can reach for him. And remember that joy is not found in the perfect Christmas day or the perfect holiday season. Joy is found in our Savior, 
our Savior who left heaven to come down to earth as a baby, to bring light into the darkness, to save our souls because he wants relationship with you and with me. And that is what it's all about. It's about relationship. And as you just embrace and rest in his love and remember how much he loves you and let him tend to your grief, to your losses, to your pain, um, I encourage you to take that and love others, to be an encouragement and support to others, to offer acts of service to other people, to invest in your family and friends, invest in the people that God has placed around you. We'll have to get creative this season, there is no doubt about that, but it can be done. I had somebody this week just drop off ornaments on my porch, and then she shared with me that each word on the ornament meant something because it was it was part of our relationship and part of how she had grown um, through our relationship, and that just meant so much to me. And so we can be a blessing to others, and when we do, our hearts are lightened, and we can really impact others. So I just encourage you, keep reaching for the light and keep reflecting the light of Jesus this Christmas season, even in the midst of the darkness. Thank you, Shauna, for sharing the lessons you've shared with others that now you are needing very much in your own life. Um, we're going to do several things if you feel like 2020 has beat you up pretty badly. In the spring, there's going to be a number of classes to help us walk through this and to find hope in Christ. And in January, there's going to be a grief class if you've lost a loved one or, or other kinds of losses. And it's a, week, it's a time when you pull together and, and you and other people who are struggling can together find hope in Christ. And then there's also a restoration class if you're finding the hurts of your past are still controlling you. And uh, all of these things you can find on our website. There's also a class for those who are struggling with pornography as we try often to find some kind of help in the created things instead of the creator. And the, the, ho the hope for those who are, or excuse me, the help for those who are struggling with pornography, the class is called the Pillars class. And then there is a class called Betrayal and Beyond for the wives and girlfriends that are impacted by their men's having a, a struggle with sexual sin. And so there's lots of ways in which this has been a difficult year. And because of that, we want to provide those extra resources and support. I want to come to the end of here, John chapter 1. And he goes on and he says, And the Word became flesh. He reiterates that again. And he made his dwelling among us. And we've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So he talks about these images of he's life and he's light. And the Gospel of John is the book that talks about all these powerful pictures. He, he draws these word pictures that, that Jesus is the bread of life that feeds our hunger, that he's the living water that quenches our thirst, that he's the good shepherd that walks with us through all of the ups and downs of life. And in the end of this, he says, this light that he's brought, this life that he's brought, let me tell you what it is. He's full of grace and truth, and Jesus brings grace. In fact, he, he contrasts him that under the old covenant, under Moses, there was law. There was an understanding of God's righteousness. And if you understand that, you realize that I have no hope that I not only have sin, but I can't stop sinning and I cannot fix myself. And the thing that Jesus brings is grace. And grace, very simply, is the loving power of God that is focused to us to save us from our sin, to bring us into his family, and to walk with us through our life when we don't deserve it. Grace really emphasizes how incredible this gift that Jesus brings and how little we deserve it. And the truth in John is that most people don't get it. He goes on to say, he came to that which was his own. I think there's several levels of that. He came to the human beings that he had breathed life into, and they'd rejected him. He came to the Jewish people. They had called out to be a nation set aside to, to represent God on earth, and they mostly rejected him. And unfortunately, no matter how bright the light, people tend to run from the light because it exposes our sin and our selfishness and our heart. And he says, most of us, most of them did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. You see, Jesus became a child so that we become children of God. There was a good friend of mine who 
actually went to school with our daughters and was involved with us in, in a number of Mexico mission trips. And, and she became very close to us and very dear. And, and then she kind of walked away from God. And we had little or no contact with her for about six years. And then it was, I think, about five years ago, just around Christmas time, I just noticed as she came into the Christmas service and she just kind of snuck in and tried to, tried to be not noticed. I went over and gave her a big hug and I said, how's it going? And she slowly told me the story of how she had walked away from God and she'd get involved in a bad marriage and how painful and difficult it had been. And she thought the problem was the guy. The problem was her life. And, and she said, you know, I... I've got my life straightened out and I'm in a house that I now own and I've got a good job. But something's still missing. She said, I, I know what it is. So I'm coming back. An exciting end of that story is she's come back to faith in Christ and she's walking with the Lord now and, and God is now filling up her life with grace. You know, I think it's so easy for us to try to give people just human help. We try to encourage them and we give gifts and we, we try to, to bring words of cheer. But the reality is, is the, what we really need is the grace of God. And he says, to all those who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gives the right to become children of God. And I don't know where you are at this Christmas time of year. I don't know what your relationship with Christ is. I know that it's been a tough year and I think when things get shaken and we get beat up, some of us run to God and some of us run away. And I hope that this will be a time when you go back and you remember that the creator of the universe, the, he became an, imprisoned in a cradle. He, he gave his life, not just at Christmas, but Christmas always has to be connected to Easter. He grew up to die on a cross so that he could take your sin and my sin and our blindness and our darkness and then he came alive again the third day so that he could give us not life. In fact, we call it being born again when you give your life to Christ. And it's very simple. You, you simply have to admit that Jesus is true and right and everything about him is true. And you have to accept that his death on the cross is what you need for your life. And you have to believe in such a way that you come to a C, you A, B, C, you commit. And in that simple step, you become a child of God. You become a part of the circle of light that Jesus has provided. You become a recipient of his grace. And you see, everything that, that Jesus brought is available to you. And I don't know what that means to you for this Christmas season, but I hope that it'll become a time of reconnection and recommitting and, and whatever has happened in this year, that you will ask Jesus to not only forgive you, but to heal you and to walk with you through 2021. And that because of that, you will experience the warmth and the connection and the life of Jesus. We have a question that we're going to encourage you to wrestle through and to talk through. And I'm going to hand off to the campus pastors and we're going to just take a few moments to close the service together. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Zach Newman and I'm the spiritual development pastor here at Family Church. We have a challenge for you. And the challenge is this Christmas, could you share with someone how Jesus has changed your life? Let me pray for us. God, thank you so much. Thank you that you are our hope. Thank you that you are the light of the world. God, help us to walk in peace this Christmas season no matter what it may look like. In Jesus' name, amen. One more thing before you go. This Christmas Eve, we're gonna be doing an online-only event I'm at 4 p.m. at a Christmas Eve service. It's going to be a great time. We're going to have things like a virtual kids choir. We're going to hear from all three campus pastors. I'm so excited and we'd love for you to join us. And I hope you have a great day and a Merry Christmas.